And we are live. It's Dr. J here in the house with Evan Brand. Today, we're going to be talking about the top five common mistakes when using digestive support. Again, we're in the trenches with patients every week from all over the world. And this is a common issue that we see is people are not using digestive support correctly. And if we don't break down our food, if we don't emulsify it, break it down, utilize it, absorb it, we're not going to get the nutrients from that meal. So it's not a given that we're eating good food. We have to go through good digestive processes to get those nutrients and to decrease stress in our gut. So I'm really excited to dive in today's topic on that. Yeah, me too. So, I mean, I was doing digestive enzymes when I still had gut infections. So I know we put together a list here and I'm going to just go straight to the one that was a little lower down the list, which was, I think possibly one of the big smoking guns for a lot of people is, and I technically should have written in our notes, not testing. My note was not addressing infections and how not addressing your gut infections leads to digestive problems. Because if you're someone who's taking supplemental acids and enzymes, but you haven't tested or treated yourself for parasites or worms or H. pylori, bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth, mold colonization, you're going to have very limited results with your enzymes and acids. So for me, I did that mistake. I just had high quality enzymes, I was taking those, but yet I still had diarrhea and other GI issues years ago because I had parasites and I hadn't tested or treated those. So that's to me, I think the big one because people will go to Whole Foods or wherever, hopefully they'll buy from us because it's professional quality, but they'll buy enzymes, take it, and then they still have GI issues and like, well, what the heck? I thought the enzymes were supposed to fix it. Yeah. And I see that. We see that all the time. Now, the question is, why is that happening? So Let's go over some of the bugs and some of the reasons why that may happen. So first off, H. pylori is a super common one. H. pylori is a bacteria that mm -hmm. resides primarily in the stomach. It can also go a little bit into the small intestine. And H. pylori is going to produce an enzyme called urease. And urease is going to take protein from, you know, which is the protein metabolite urea, and it's going to convert it into um, ammonia and CO2. And so on a positive H. pylori breath test, we're going to see elevations in CO2 after you swallow the urea from the breath test. And you're also going to see a lot of ammonia. Now, ammonia has got a pH of 11. And so that's more on the alkaline side. So your gut's only a two or three on the pH. So that can start to alkalinize the gut and maybe throw off the digestive capacity because we need that nice, that nice low pH helps activate enzymes and acids. Well, it actually en act activates more of the enzymes. So that could be pepsin, various proteolytic enzymes, and it sets the table for the pancreas and the gallbladder to produce more enzymes, lipase, bile, when we get into the small intestine. So the acidity and the pH sets the deck, it sets the domino rally, so digestion works downstream. And so infections like H. pylori can cause problems. Infections like SIBO can also cause problems. SIBO is notorious for making it harder for that esophageal sphincter to close. And so if that esophageal sphincter can't close, there's prone, you have proneness to having that acid rise up and burn your esophagus, right? Those are all potential problems. Also, any stressor or infection, whether it's H. pylori, SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or it could even be something like a parasite, these infections are going to create sympathetic nervous system stress. And so the more your nervous system is over stressed, that sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight tone is being stimulated. What's going to happen is that fight or flight is going to take digestive enzymes and acids. It's going to reduce them. It's going to start shunting a lot of the digestive secretions and the blood flow away from the blood, away from the stomach and the core and to the hands and the feet to run, fight and flee. Cause our body is trying to move blood and move resources to the areas that are most metabolically high in expenditure. And in a, in a fight or flight circumstance, that's going to be the extremities fighting, fleeing, running, and our body's prehistorically driven that way because you don't want to be hungry when you're running. You don't want to think about digestion. You want to be focused on getting away or fighting. And that blood has to carry oxygen so these muscles can work. And so that blood moves away from the intestines. And that's part of the reason why these infections can really throw off your body. They can really increase that sympathetic nervous system and take away from that vagal tone, vagus nerve, parasympathetic nervous system response. Yeah, I can totally relate. I mean, when I had infections, I was anxious, but I had nausea and I had no appetite. So I would sit down. I remember it like yesterday when I was down in Austin, I would sit down at the dinner table. I just cooked an amazing bison steak and maybe I had some veggies with it. And I remember looking at the plate and going, ah, 
I just can't do it. And some of that was the infections, but some of it was the stress from the infections. And some people, they'll kind of demonize meats and say, well, I don't feel good. Like I, I just can't do the meat. It's not the meat in general. That's the problem. It's the infections damaging the parietal cells, reducing the stomach acid. It's turning that digestive fire back on. That's really going to help you feel good with those meats. So I, I, it's sad because people get scared away from the meat, but in reality, it's some of these root causes that we're talking about. And then you hit on this kind of primal response. This is totally normal, by the way, but it's not normal in our chronic stressed lifestyle. So occasionally if we were stressed, it'd be great. Like you said, turn off the digestive system so we can run. But the problem is we're, our, we're always stressed now. We've never, as humans, we've never experienced this level of chronic ongoing stress. I mean, I pull my audience all the time. I'll do little polls on my Instagram page and ask people like, how you feeling? Everybody's stressed. Everybody's overworked. Everybody's burned out. So this is an epidemic problem. This is not like a one-off thing. This is everywhere. And I think we could transition now if you're ready. And we could talk about how too much or too little HCL when you're trying to get this digestive fire back on, there is kind of a sweet spot and it's going to depend on the people. It's going to depend on gut inflammation, maybe diet, infections. And then let me just bring up before I forget, these infections are very contagious. So if you do have H. pylori, it's very probable that your spouse is infected as well. So if you're someone working on your gut and you're not working on your significant other's gut, you probably need to, whether you're running testing or maybe you're guessing and checking, which is not as wise, but we'll see a husband or a wife come in, they'll work with us clinically, they have good results. And then two to three months later, they go backwards. That's often because the and uh, the, the infection came back due to the significant other. And this could even be from children as well, or even dogs. Like if you've got a dog with H. pylori, you're playing with a slobbery toy, you're throwing the slobbery toy, then up oh, you pick your nose, you bite your nails, whatever, boom, you could get, you know, exposed to the vectors that way too. 100%. So with the too much and too little HCL, some people, their gut lining is so inflamed. They have atrophic gastritis, meaning that gut lining has gotten really thin and they may not be able to handle much HCL, even though they need HCL, they may not be able to handle it. And that becomes dicey. So it's all about helping people where they're at, even though they need something, if they can't receive it, then we need a backup plan. And so you got to know where people are at. And so some people, their digestive system or symptoms actually get better with more HCL, even though their gut has a lot of problems and they have a lot of inflammation. Some people, their gut lining integrity can still deal with the HCL where you start adding HCL and it's like, they start getting better. And you're like, but your gut's so inflamed. How are you able to receive it? But then patient A over here couldn't receive it. So everyone's a little bit different. And so if we're going to try HCL, I mean, ideally don't try it. If you know, there's any ulcerations, uh, coughing up blood, blood in the stool. I had one person though, a couple people who've had ulcerations though, did it. And they're like, it helped my issues. I felt so much better. And actually my ulcer stopped. Now that may be the exception, I'm just kind of highlighting if you are that person, tread lightly, work with a practitioner. And of course, all reactions are dose dependent. So if you're going to test it, try the very smallest dose you possibly can, maybe even a little bit of lemon juice or apple cider vinegar and some water, dilute it down and then test it. And if you overdo it, you can always try a little bit of baking soda in, in water to kind of calm it down if you irritated it. But ideally, don't do it unless you're working with someone that's uh, helping you on the functional medicine side. And uh, if you do it, make sure it's dose dependent on that side. Yeah, good call. So just we'll give a couple numbers. I think numbers are helpful. So if you're working into HCL, I know you and I, we have some professional manufacturers we work with. We make our own line of digestive products. We go pretty conservative, like 200 milligrams of betaine per capsule. So we could dose that as low as one cap, 200 milligram. We could go up two, three, four, five, six. So you could go, I'd say 200 on the low end up to, I personally don't see a need much beyond maybe a couple of grams, 2000 milligrams. And even that to me is sometimes too high for certain people. I just don't like to push it. I know you and I've talked about that uh, test where people will take a ton of HCL until they get burning and then back down from that dose. But I prefer not to poke the beehive. So I personally don't do that with people. So I will do that within five or six capsules. And it depends if someone has a lot of digestive mm -hmm. distress, you know, we're typically not going to go that high, but usually within five or six capsules, that tends to be okay. And Dr. Jonathan Wright's book, why you need stomach acid. He talks about, you know, being able to go up to four to five grams of HCL. And again, I typically wouldn't do that if someone's having any ulcerations or any incredible gastritis issues. 
Um, usually we're going to test at a much smaller level than that. And, and even with them, we're still starting at maybe one capsule and we're gently going up. And of course, we're taking the digestive support in the middle of the meal, because if your gut's raw and inflamed, just enough of that acid leaning on that gut lining directly isn't going to be a problem. At least if there's some food down, then think of the Oreo cookie, right? You get the cream, you get the, the frosting in the middle. Think of the HCL is in the middle of all the food. And therefore the body tends to mix it up. And then when it starts moving throughout the intestinal tract or the, or the stomach, it's not going to be as intense at the, the tissue area. And so that tends to be very helpful. And I'll typically, you know, try it within four or five capsules, see if we have an improvement. Some people do. Uh, I hear doctors doing that up to 10, 20 capsules. Uh, that's, I think you're just messing with trouble. You're messing with fire there because your body has to use bicarbonate in from the pancreas to start to neutralize the acid from the stomach. So like that domino rally of digestion, you have all this chyme mixed up in your stomach. That chyme is all the food with the acids and the enzymes that has to get released from the stomach down into the small intestine. And so it's nice low pH. Once that goes into the small intestine, right? The duodenum, we start making a whole bunch of bicarbonate to neutralize that. Now, bile acid will also be produced. Bile acid still an acid. It's still a pH of around five or so. So it's still on the acidic side. People have written in, oh, bile acids, well, it's a, it's a P it's a pH neutral. Well, you know, we're talking bile acids. Bile is made up of bile acids, cholesterol, a lot of different substances. So the bile acids are in their very nature by their name on the acidic side. So typically your body's trying to take that pH and bring it up to a neutral pH. And the more you stress it with tons and tons of HCL, there's a greater chance that your bicarbonate system may not be able to handle it from your pancreas and you could develop a peptic ulcer. So we got to be careful with that. Try to use HCL within a reasonable range. And if you're going to test it, you know, and you just be careful with it, just be careful, make sure you're taking a look at your gut and making sure you're you're, you're knowing what your calprotectin levels are and, and you're, and you're taking it the right way. That is like the pinnacle of edutainment right there. That was so entertaining to listen to. I'm picturing all this going on in the system. I'm learning at the same time. This is why I love what we do. This is so fun. All right, let's go to, let's go to number two here on our list, which is supporting or healing the gut lining and how that's very important to do possibly even before you get to the digestive support. So you and I are seeing tons of people that usually have been to previous practitioners or doctors or naturopaths or whoever before us. And so maybe they have healed their gut somewhat already, or maybe they've been wrecked because other practitioners did too much or they did too hardcore things. I had one lady who she got put on really high biofilm busting support right in the beginning. Yep. Um, she got put on the interface plus from clear labs, which we can and, and do use sometimes, but man, it wrecked her gut. It, her stomach was so raw. We had to do almost six weeks of gut healing support before we could even bring in any other support in. And that's kind of a reverse order thing because you and I talk about this idea of healing the gut after you treat the infections. But man, in her case, we couldn't do that. So I've seen firsthand what can happen if you do too much bowel film support, you're aggravating an aggravated system. It's just not good. Exactly. And that's why if we're having someone with an inflamed gut, one of the first things we're going to be doing is trying to really dial in digestive nutrients to heal the gut lining. So we may be adding in things like DGL licorice, aloe, slippery elm. Sometimes we're going to do a lot of zinc or zinc carnosine. There's a lot of studies on zinc helping to decrease gut permeability, which is really important. Uh, decreasing gut inflammation. There's studies on zinc showing to decrease calprotectin in the intestinal tract. So that's wonderful. Of course, L-glutamine. If you're very histamine sensitive or very inflamed, sometimes L-glutamine can go downstream to uh, glutamic acid and glutamate, and you may have negative symptoms there. Uh, again, uh, typically I don't see that. And, and so we don't see that, I'd say 95% of the time, there's no problem with that, but we wanna be able to use other nutrients to calm down the gut. Vitamin U, which is vitamin ulcer, you see that in like a lot of okra, things like that, cabbage juice. Um, I would say aloe, we already mentioned. And then of course, there's just good old fashioned bone broth and collagen peptides, which are very, very high in glycine. And glycine is very important building block for the enterocytes that make up the gut lining. The enterocytes are little cells that, that make up the tight junctions in the gut lining in the intestinal tract. And so they love, love, love glycine. And of course, the, the same cells that are helping to build the intestinal tract, they also help with toxification. 
glycine is a very important compound intoxication. So if you have a lot of gut inflammation, your body's going to be using a lot of that glycine for healing inflamed tissue and maybe not running the toxification. So that's part of the reason why you can have the toxification problems because your gut's chronically inflamed because it's sucking a lot of the resources that it may be using for detox. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. So there's a lot of talk, Stephanie Sinef, and I know some others have talked about using glycine to help glyphosate detox. Yep. So that's pretty interesting mechanism there. You're saying that the system can't focus on the detox if it's so focused on the gut damage. The body's always tending to deal with what the more acute matter is. Mm -hmm. And if your gut's raw and inflamed, it's probably going to prioritize that over detoxification. And again, we don't have like a test to, to say that. We just kind of have common sense, functional medicine, healing philosophy the body's always prioritizing stuff. And whatever the, the top stress is, the more apparent stress is, that's where your body's typically allocating resources. Yeah, and I don't want to get too in the weeds on this, but I'll just bring up an example of that. For example, sex drive and libido. When we see people that are chronically stressed and depleted, usually sex drive is going to go down or become non-existent. I ask that question on my intake form, is your libido adequate? And all the sick people, no, their libido is not adequate. And my interpretation of that is libido is really... A, it's a luxury to be able to do that. You've got to have some optimal things that, that happen. Obviously there's other mechanisms at play, but just at a simple basic level, you know, sex is a luxury when you're running from a bear, you're not going to, you know, be aroused if you're running from a bear and that bear could be your boss or your spouse or your kids, if they're driving you crazy and libido's like, ah, whatever. So that makes sense. Yeah. And if you just look at how the, the, the nervous system allocates uh, sexual energy, so typically foreplay or just, you know, that intimacy that you're going to have before ejaculation or before an orgasm, that's all parasympathetic. And so you need parasympathetic nervous system stimulation for, you know, the foreplay aspect of intimacy. And if the parasympathetic isn't there, you know, that's where you see premature ejaculation, right? Because ejaculation or orgasm is sympathetic and foreplay is parasympathetic. And so if you don't have parasympathetic stimulation happening because you're so stressed, you're so inflamed... It, you know, that's where premature ejaculation or just not even being able to rise to the occasion if you catch my drift because the parasympathetic nervous system response is so squashed. Yeah, and this is a huge problem. I mean, I've seen 20 year old guys that are jumping on quote the little blue pill and you've got all these websites now that are promoting like off the market Viagra. It's like, what the heck? Like, we have like teenagers and 20 year olds now like carrying around not that, you know, used to be like when, you know, high school it was kind of the cool joke thing to have, but you got a condom in your wallet. Now it's like you have a condom and you have Viagra as a yeah. teenager. That's, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's why you typically need a couple hours of stress-free conversation and, and uh, connection before, before that kind of nervous system stimulation can happen. You can't just go, it's, it's harder to go into a stressful day, switch the switch. And then there you go. It's just tough. And that's because of the nervous system. And so we just gotta, we gotta know that. Give us your comments. Do you want a functional medicine optimization of libido podcast? If so, let us know. Give us some yeah, comments. Let us know. Let and us know. We'll, we'll do it. We'll chat about it. That's great. All right. I would say next thing we can kind of, we talked about the gut lining support. Let's talk about um, bile support. So bile is really important for fat digestion. A lot of women are going to be affected by bile issues because it's very common. Women, when they're 40s, they tend to get their gallbladder removed. It's a common procedure. You have any upper right quadrant pain issues, boom, they're taking out your gallbladder right away. And your gallbladder is part of what concentrates bile. Your liver will make it and then it stores it in the gallbladder and then it gets released um, at very specific times via cholecystic kinin CCK stimulation. And CCK is gonna be stimulated when you have a whole bunch of fat and protein going, getting released from your stomach into the small intestine. So then we get to release it. It happens at a very specific time and it's concentrated 15 to 20 times more than just what your liver would drip it in. Cause when you don't have a gallbladder, it's just got to drip in. And when it drips, you can, you can have bile acid diarrhea. And so that's where you have to use bile acid sequestering agents to kind of calm it down. And we got to put our bile in at the right time. And so we may have to take supplemental bile definitely for life. If we don't have a gallbladder, if we have biliary insufficiency, we're going to have to be taking bile as well, maybe extra lipase, which is a fat enzyme from the pancreas. But if we don't break down that fat, you know, we're going to see our stool start to float. We're going to start to see, you know, streak marks, skid marks on the toilet seat because the fat is, um, is streaking. It's not well absorbed. And then you're also going to see a lot more excessive wipes when you go to the bathroom, when you clean yourself, because it's just fat is streaky, right? It's, it uh, makes a big mess. And so we got to break down that fat adequately. And then we may have to add extra bile into digestive support. We may have to add extra 
lipolytic enzymes as well. Also, if you're a female or even a male, high levels of estrogen is going to make your bile flow more stagnant. So if your bile flow is more stagnant, you're not going to have good biliary output. And I would say last but not least, if, if you're one of these people that got thrown into a low fat diet, well, when you go low fat, your gallbladder is not emptying because the trigger for gallbladder emptying is cholecystokinin from fat consumption. If your gallbladder is not empty, what happens to all that bile? It can start to form bile crystals and those crystals are sharp. And when you finally do eat a little bit of fat, it's like giving a, a hug to a porcupine. All right. It's going to be quite painful. And so imagine your gallbladder contracting. Boom. It's like giving that porcupine a big hug and you're going to inflame that gallbladder. And so chronic low fat diets um, with a punctuated higher fat meal and also coming in there with um, estrogen dominance, a lot of detoxification issues, not handling estrogen well, maybe having a lot of estrogen in, in your meats, in your pesticides, in your plastics goes for guys too. That could definitely screw up your gallbladder and cause biliary insufficiency, not enough bile flow to that gallbladder. Wow. Okay. So let me just clarify, cause this is interesting stuff here because people online, including us, we're really big proponents of good quality pastured animal products and high quality fats. We're a big proponent of that. But you're saying that when a person comes in, let's say they came from the brainwashing of the even 2000s. I mean, part of me wants to say 1980s, 90s and 2000s, but it's still there's still the low fat dogma still there. That's still like one of the labels on a product low in fat that's still marketed today. So this is still a trend. You're saying someone coming from that with gallbladder issues, with infections, with low stomach acid, then they try to go keto, carnivore, meat-based, paleo, whatever, they end up with problems. If they have like a gallbladder issue or a gallbladder attack, the doctor's going to blame maybe the fats and just cut the gallbladder out. But you're saying there's kind of a, a few steps, if you will, that have to be a prerequisite to handle a higher fat diet properly. Yeah. I mean, one, we just have the propaganda of the eighties and nineties and just the fact that calories in calories out right? Oh, well, you're worried about how many calories you consume. Well, we know one gram of fat's got nine calories in it compared to four on the protein and four on the carbs. So of course, uh, fat gets to be looked at more deeply on that side just because of the caloric intake. And then also if you're, um, you know, a lot of the studies on fat causing heart disease, which we know are, are all nonsense. We know that the meta analyses in the last 10 years show there's no correlation with that, with fat and, and animal uh, cholesterol. A lot of the studies in the 60s and 70s they did not differentiate saturated fat with trans fats. And so they had a whole bunch of trans fats mixed in with a lot of these experiments. And you didn't really get good data because they had the trans fats, which we know hydrogenated vegetable oils are terrible and bad for our health. We know that. So you got to pull out those confounding variables to really get good data. And so we know that in the last 10, 15 years, that that is not the case and that cholesterol and fat is going to be fine. It's really going to be the sugar, the trans fats, and maybe an argument for a lot of the refined processed vegetable oils. These vegetable oils during the processing of them, they get damaged because they're polyunsaturated fats. Omega-6, they get damaged and they create a lot of oxidative stress and they get stored in your cell membranes for a long time. Yeah, these are these are super bad oils and they're everywhere. I mean, even at Whole Foods, if you go and look at organic potato chips, you're still sometimes going to see cottonseed oil, you're going to see sunflower oil, you're going to see canola oil. I mean, I get frustrated because Whole Foods kind of markets themselves as healthy. But if you go to like their, I don't even know if you call the buffet, but their hot bar, if you will, canola. every single food item they have, there's canola oil in everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just cheap. And then there's also a lot of stuff on the olive oil being fake, right? So you, you got to look at that too. But that's why at least half your fat should be high quality animal saturated fats, because one, those fats are just really stable. They're going to be really temperature stable. And um, if you're getting organic, decent fat, there's no processing of that that's going to damage the fat like you may have with um, a vegetable oil. But ideally, try to get cold pressed, try to get organic, try to get reputable brands that you know, aren't going to be a blend of other canola oil mixed in, which is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hit another point, which is important mm -hmm. is the fact that the bile has some antimicrobial properties and yes. how all these estrogen dominance issues you're hitting on, you're hitting on the low mm -hmm. fat, you're hitting on maybe the, the no gallbladder. Yep. It makes sense why we see so many women, for example, that have had their gallbladders removed. They have massive, massive gut infections. Yep. Correct. And so bile is antimicrobial. And so it's going to make it harder for bugs to grow in the small intestinal tract. And so just having good biliary output, it's going to act like antimicrobials and make it harder for these bugs and dysbiosis to grow. So having good fats in there, going to stimulate good bile 
stimulation and flow. And that bioflow is going to help you emulsify and break down the fat. And it's also going to make the environment harder for bugs to grow. So it's definitely a win-win on both sides of the front there. Yeah. You and I don't have any published studies to say, Hey, we had 278 patients and you know, 275 had their gallbladders removed and all 275 had SIBO. We don't have it like published like that, but I know that you would agree clinically what we've seen, you know, combined over the last 10 plus years is that we see tons of SIBO, CFO issues. And a lot of those people have gallbladder issues or they don't have a gallbladder period. So it's definitely, definitely correlated. Yeah. 100%. And it's good to, to look at that. No, I would say next thing we can kind of switch into is cooking our foods. I mean, sometimes um, fermentable uh, carbohydrates, sometimes just the fiber in those foods, the rawness of the foods, the anti-nutrients, lectins, salicylates, phenols, uh, can really be irritating to someone's gut if it's already raw. And so sometimes just one cooking those foods can be wonderful. Sometimes even switching to a carnivore diet, as long as we can handle the fats and proteins can be great because you're decreasing all those anti-nutrients. Sometimes just really making sure everything's really cooked and steamed and sauteed, or maybe using an Instapot or some kind of a, a method to really help break it down. And then of course, low hanging fruit, like just chewing your food up really well to like almost like an oatmeal, like liquid consistency, making sure you're not overly hydrating with your meal, maybe just a couple ounces of water to get some pills down, but that's it. You're hydrating 10, 15 minutes before two hours after, because water's got a pH of seven, right? And your stomach's a pH of two, two and a half. And you add a whole bunch of seven, there was a bunch of two and a half, you start raising the pH, plus you're diluting all your enzymes and acids, so the potencies drop. So all those things matter. Yeah, here was an interesting thing. I looked at some of the videos and I, I interviewed him on my podcast too, super cool guy, Paul Saladino, who wrote a carnivore book and he talks a lot about carnivore diets. He visited the Hadza tribe and something interesting is he thinks that we're really like over hydrating. Like if you watch these people, these tribal people, obviously they don't have water bottles and they don't have really access to water the way we do, but he would notice they would eat an entire meal with no liquid. And then here yeah. we are in America, you go to the restaurant and they're like, what do you like to drink, sir? And if you're like water, they bring you a freaking huge cup. I mean, it's probably 16, 20 ounces of ice water. It's cold, which I, I don't know. People may debate me on this. I don't know if ice water is necessarily good around meals either. I just feel like no. From an it energetic sits in your perspective. stomach longer, it sits in your stomach longer because your stomach's not going to release. If, you, if your internal body temperature is around 99, 98 degrees and you drink a whole bunch of 50 degree water, your body's going to hold that water in the stomach until it gets up to body temperature and then release it. I mean, very simple, just drink a whole bunch of cold water and you'll feel it sloshing around, drink room temperature water and you'll feel it move through your body way faster. When you move around five, 10 minutes later, you won't feel the sloshing. Ah, uh, you know, see, just intuitively, I just keep, I just drink room temperature water. Now there are on a really hot day. Yeah. I like some ice water, but just like normally during the office hours, you know, I'm just drinking room temperature water and I feel so much better with it, but yeah. So sorry, I, I got on a little tangent, but I was just it's, saying, it's the not a big deal. It's not a big deal. If you do that and drink one, drink cold water, just be careful of drinking really cold water right before a meal, because it will take longer to move through. So at least if you're going to do cold water, make sure it's not 10 minutes before meal. Okay. Okay. Understood. But yeah, anyway, the idea was like, he saw these tribal people and how they're, how they're eating and drinking. And, you know, they didn't really do meal combining. There's a lot of like, when you go to a restaurant, there's this feeling that you got to have your meat and then your vegetable and then your potato. And obviously this is different. I'm not saying we all need to live like tribal people, but what I'm saying is I, I find it very interesting that their life is more what our DNA expects. Meaning if they're walking along and they stop upon a bush, they might just gorge on these berries. Or if they stop and find this baobab tree with a particular type of honey in it, they'll cut open the tree, find the beehive, they'll eat just a meal of honey. And then they get the kill and they eat just the meat. So I personally have experimented with that, like just meat, just berries, just starch and just try to play around with it as opposed to doing the steak with the broccoli with the sweet potato and i personally do feel better on just those single items so i've i've definitely been leaning more that direction and i feel significantly better yeah i think it, you know a couple of things one i think most of their meals are probably going to have more protein in it because if you kill an animal that that meat lasts way longer and if you look at a lot of the the fruit they were to have back then, I've looked at a lot of these um, studies that they're a lot more tart, a lot more bitter. They aren't like overly sweet. Like we've, due to hybridization and genetic selection, we've kind of chose the sweetest berries, the sweetest this. So a lot of the fruits way sweeter than what you would have typically found in nature on average. And um, things like honey would have been a rarity. It wouldn't have been something that you're, you're have access to every single day. And so um, we have access to it every day. So, you know, if it's a, something that's 
every now and then it's probably not a big deal, but if they were doing honey like that every single day and they weren't as active, right. Cause they have to be really active to hunt and kill and do all their stuff. There may be metabolic issues. Oh yeah. I think he, I read, he was just trying to keep up with the tribe. I want to say they were doing something like 10 miles a day walking. I mean, yeah. just an insane amount of steps. Yeah. Anytime one, your stress is decent, right. Cause you know, most of their life was just focused on, um, the next meal, right? Killing, having their next meal, obviously making sure shelter is stable, but once shelter is good, then really most of your focus is on uh, food. Mm -hmm. I say food and safety for the tribe. That's it. You know, you're not having to go pay a big mortgage down or worried about your kid's private school, right? You know, is that so different priorities, right? Have you and seen so, the organic strawberries lately? My God, they're freaking yes, huge. They're dude. like small apples, man. Yeah. I, I had a couple over the weekend. They were like almost the size of my hand. I was like, holy smokes. Well, cause I kind of nice. thought that organic was, and I guess I thought wrong. This is me being dumb, I guess, but I thought that organic had a little bit of separation from the conventional practices, meaning the hybridization process. But my God, you look at some of these apples now too, they're like softballs. Oh yeah. I mean, just farmers naturally over hundreds of years, they're going to just start selecting seeds and, and, and crops that are going to be more tasty, just, just natural selection of what sells. And so that tends to shift over time where if things are just growing in mother nature, um, you know, we don't quite have that ability to, to select it as much. Yeah. I don't so, know if yeah. you've seen this, but I go, you know, I'll be out in the woods and I'll find some wild strawberries. They're tiny. They're like the size of your pinky fingernail. Yep. Real small. Yeah. yeah, no, totally. So yeah. But most important thing is the food quality. And um, of course, if you have insulin resistance and, and you're inflamed, you know, leaning to less sugar is always better just because your body doesn't have, you know, if you're the Hunza, right. And you're walking 10 miles a day, hiking and doing all these things you have the, the ability to burn all that stuff up. No problem. It's not a problem. It's yeah. when you have, don't have the ability to burn it up. What's your body going to do with it? So then it gets stored in the liver. It's going to stored in the muscles. And then when that's tapped, it's going to get converted to fat and you'll get insulin resistance. We got to have, we got to be careful with that. Yeah. And the main last point there was just adjusting how your food is cooked based on what's going on with your gut. So if you've got infections, like for me, I rarely ever do leafy green salads. Raw just doesn't agree with my gut. And so I don't do it. And I could, I'm sure I could work it in, but to me, I feel, I feel good. My gut feels good. I feel good. So I'm okay with cooked veggies and those work yeah. for me. So yeah. Worst case, just take your veggies, lay it out in a frying pan and put a really good saturated fat down and some sea salt, you know, and, um, and broil it, you know, for 20 minutes at 400, nice roasted vegetables are pretty good. As long as you're using a good, healthy fat on it, it's wonderful. Yeah. Would you recommend something like ghee? Because if you go too hot with butter, you might get some smoke, right? So would you say do yeah. ghee or what do you like? You could do ghee or any tallows. You could do a little bit of avocado oil. Avocado oil is pretty heat stable. You just got to make sure you're looking at what the heat is. So you don't overdo based on the smoke point. Mm -hmm. Okay. That'd be cool. It. Well, anything else what? you want to hit on? I just think people that are listening here, if you're struggling and you're having a hard time, you know, feel free to reach out to someone like Evan and I would be happy to help you out. And you can see Evan at evanbrand.com. And feel free, you can schedule with him worldwide, as well as myself, Dr. J at justinhealth.com. Happy to help you guys out. Also, put your comments down below. Let us know your thoughts on the topic. Let us know what you've done, what's helped you in the past. Um, you know, we learn a lot through our patients because, you know, when you only have yourself, that's, that's only one person. But when you have thousands of people that you can learn from, you, you just see what works. You don't need a scientific study to tell you because you see it, it's real. And then we apply it to help our patients. So we really appreciate y'all sharing your stories here as well. And reach yeah. out, links below for everything, guys. And then make sure you share with family and friends. If they, if they could benefit, please put it in their inbox or share it on social media. We really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, awesome job. And yeah, once again, justinhealth.com or evanbrand.com, please reach out. We'd love to help you. And, you know, we didn't talk about it too much today because this is more focused on other things, but testing is part of this protocol. So figuring out exactly what we're doing, how we're doing it, when we're doing it, why we're doing it, it is based on testing. We're not just using you as a guinea pig. We are truly looking at calprotectin and steatocrit and elastase. Yes. There's, there's, yes. there's so many biomarkers that we didn't even discuss that we're working into that. So I just want you to know that we're not coming in blind here. We have data that we're using, which helps us to guide these protocols and that's really where the magic happens is once you get to the, get the data so test don't guess reach out if you need help and we'll be in touch next week yeah just to highlight that on the digestive side we're looking at markers like steatocrit which if that's high that's a lot of maldigested fat if we have a lot of calprotectin or lactoferrin or increased immune response like iga that means there's stuff going on in the gut and so it's good to know that ahead of time so we can really quantify what's happening or maybe even gut permeability like zonio and that can all be very helpful so i'm glad you touched upon that we'll put links below guys for everything that you guys need to, to take next steps and you guys have a phenomenal week